Okay, go ahead. So I hope you all had a good holiday. It's really funny. This is only the second time we've been back in 10 years in America where Christmas means something. And I've been in, in Asia and Christmas is just another day. So it's real interesting. Oh, interesting time. So the sutta tonight is Sutta 106, The Way to the Imperturbable. This is a fairly advanced sutta to be giving. But take any notes and let me know at the end if you didn't understand, and I'll try to explain. Thus, as I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the Kuru country in a town of the Kurus named Kama Sadama. That's a cute name. There the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, venerable sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this, Monks, sensual pleasures are impermanent, hollow, false, deceptive. They are illusionary, the prattle of fools. <laughs> sensual pleasures here and now, sensual pleasures in lives, to come, sensual perceptions here and now, and sensual perceptions in lives to come, both alike are Mara's realm, Mara's domain, Mara's bait, Mara's hunting ground. I learned an interesting thing about Mara. We always call him he, but that's just so you understand who we're talking about. He, he was asexual. He didn't have any sex at all. So, and he, he was very much attached to sensual pleasures and thought everybody should have these sensual pleasures and uh, eat, drink, and be merry for the rest of your life that comes from Mara. So, on the account of them, these evil, unwholesome mental states, such as covetousness, ill will, and presumption, arise and they constitute an obstruction to the noble disciple in training here. All of you are noble disciples because you're practicing. Now the practice can be just using the six R's in your daily activities, as well as sitting in meditation. Now we get to the imperturbable. Therein, monks and noble disciple considers thus, sensual pleasures here and now, sensual pleasures in lives to come, constitute an obstruction to a noble disciple in training. Suppose I were to abide with a mind abundant, exalted, having transcended the world, and made a determination with the mind. That means that you're, you make a determination to stay in one of the jhanas. And we're talking about the four lower jhanas. And the highest of that is staying in equanimity. Now, when you get into equanimity on a regular basis and you stay there, what me, that means is you have disenchantment with sensual pleasures. They just don't interest you so much. 
So it's not a distraction for you ever. Your mind has this perfect balance in it and, and your mind is calm all the time. That comes out in your voice. When I do so, there will be no more evil, unwholesome mental states such as covetous ill will and presumption of me with the abandonment that my mind will be unlimited, immeasurable, well-developed. So this is a very good thing to do, and that is develop your mastery of going in and out of a jhana until you get to the equanimity where you can stay in that equanimity all the time. And that takes care of all emotional upsets. That takes care of sadness, fear, anxiety, depression, all of those things occur because in the past you broke precepts. When you're in a jhana, you don't break precepts. Your mind is pure. Your mind is uplifted. So it's a real good practice to develop your mind in such a way that you can stay in the jhana anytime you want to. What does jhana mean? It means a level of understanding. That's all it means. So, when he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. Once there is full confidence, he either attains to the imperturbable now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. Re resolving upon it with wisdom means keeping the practice of six Rs and understanding how dependent origination actually works. On the dissolution of the body, after death, it is possible that this, covet, this consciousness of his leading to rebirth may pass on to rebirth in the imperturbable. Again, imperturbable means no fluctuation, no, no uh, wavering of being in that jhana. This monk is declared by me to be the first way to direct to the imperturbable. Again, a noble disciple considers thus. There are sensual pleasures here and now, sensual pleasures in lives to come, sensual perceptions here and now, and sensual perception in lives to come. Whatever material form there is, all material form is the four great elements. And the material form has some degree or other of the four elements, air, fire, uh, wind and water. They all have different degrees of those elements in them. So you start realizing that that's all material form is. It's just these four elements. And that helps to keep your balance with uh, over excitement of material forms. There are times when you, your shirt has a hole in it, you need to get a new shirt, 
you go get a new shirt, but it doesn't excite you to do it. It's just something that has to be done. When he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. I just learned something that David and I were talking about today. And uh, somebody asked the Buddha about this man that uh, had really, really strong confidence in the Buddha and the power of that confidence. And they asked where he was reborn, and he was reborn in one of the high, he, he never did any meditation, but he was reborn in one of the higher uh, deva lokas. And he was there for a period of time and came down to another and then another and then he was reborn as a Pacheka Buddha, never having done any meditation. It was his confidence in the Buddha. Having confidence in the Buddha is really a remarkable thing. Now in uh, Burma, there's a lot of monks that they recite the uh, good qualities of the Buddha, nine good qualities of the Buddha with the, their beads. And they gain such confidence in the Buddha that they are at some point are going to probably be reborn as a Pacheka Buddha. Now this is over huge long periods of time, of course. There are Pacheka Buddhas that can be in the same lifetime and they can even know each other. <clears throat> but there is never any attachment to any of them. So it's a, when you have absolutely convinced that the Buddha was real and you're absolutely convinced that uh, he was teaching the right way. You have the potential to be reborn as a Pacheka Buddha. They call it a silent Buddha. That's just an interesting side note that we discussed today. I thought it was kind of fun. Once there is full confidence, oh, uh, for a period of time, for, for three months, a whole range retreat, I recited this uh, good qualities of the Buddha and I reflected on it a lot. Now, the way the Buddha, the way the Burmese do it is they do forwards and backwards. Araham, 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 Samasambudo, Samasambudo, Araham, like that. And you have to go all the way through without making a mistake. And you do that nine times in a sitting. At the end of three months, I could do that in four or five minutes. That's how good I got at doing it. Of course, that's gone away since I don't do that so much anymore. Anyway, while I was sitting doing that, I had an image come into my mind the, of the Buddha while he was giving a Dhamma talk. And I felt the confidence just build up and it just covered me. It was wonderful. I was happy for a week after that. And it was not good conditions I was living in. So being happy was real spectacular. Just to let you know that these kind of things can happen for you. But it takes work. Once there is full confidence, 
he either attains to the imperturbable, that means gets into a jhana, here and now, or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. And you start seeing how the links of dependent origination actually work, and you start really getting a lot of confidence in that. It's kind of interesting that there's a lot of people, quote, Buddhists, that don't know anything about dependent origination. And this is the backbone of the Buddhist teaching. Every link has the Four Noble Truths in it. And it gets more and more clear as you go and you start to notice <clears throat> other people and how they do things. And you can see those links. Sometimes it's just five or six links that you might see, but you can see how this actually does work. And you can see it in animals. We have dogs around here and you can see how dependent origination works with them, especially our bigger dog. It's, it's real easy to see his greed and lust for food arise because he's really a chow hound. So <clears throat> on the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that this consciousness of his leading to rebirth may pass on to rebirth in the imperturbable. Now, the imperturbable is really talking about the first, second, third, and fourth jhanas. The other states of meditation, <coughs> they're all part of the fourth jhana. The other state, states are called the immaterial jhanas. There's still radiance around the different beings, but there's no material form. This monk is declared to be the second way directed to the imperturbable. Again, a noble disciple considers thus sensual pleasures here and now, sensual pleasures in lives to come. Sensual perceptions here and now, and sensual perception in lives to come. Material forms here and now, and material form in lives to come. Perception of forms here and now, and perception of forms in lives to come. Both alike are imperturbable, or are impermanent, excuse me. What is impermanent is not worth delighting in, not worth welcoming, not worth holding to. Well, when you are successful with your meditation, you go beyond that to the immaterial. And there's real relief in that. There's a kind of happiness that is just, ah, oh, no more having to put up with any of this material things again. Of course, you're in that for a small, a short period of time, then you come back to the material realm, but you're not attached to the material realm anymore. And you live a life full of balance. Think about what relief there is if there is no more arguments. If there's no more anger. Nice. That's what we're working for. When he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. 
once there's full confidence, he either attains to the imperturbable now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. <clears throat> On the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that this consciousness of her of his leading to rebirth may pass on to the re, to rebirth in the imperturbable. This monks is declared to be the third way directed to the imperturbable. Again, the noble considers thus the sensual pleasures here and now, sensual pleasures in lives to come, sensual perceptions here and now, and sexual perceptions in lives to come, material form here and now, and material forms in lives to come, perception of forms here and now, and perception of forms in lives to come. What are you doing? Oh. Okay. Technical problems. Perceptions of the imperturbable are all our perceptions. Now, when I'm talking to you about the five aggregates, the definition of perceptions is different than the perceptions that we have right now. Perceptions that we're using right now means being aware of. Okay. So when we're talking directly about meditation, Perceptions have to do with memory and, and that sort of thing. So that, that's the real difference of the use of this word. Where these perceptions cease without remainder, that is the peaceful, that is sublime, namely the base of nothingness. When you get into the immaterial realms, this is what we're talking about. Right now it's saying, with nothingness. When nothingness occurs, you're not looking outside your mind anymore. You're starting to look directly at it. So material things don't have any meaning when you're in that realm. It's all a mental realm. This is the very beginning of teaching yourself to watch mind. And then you watch it in a finer way when you get into neither perception nor non-perception. When he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. Having confidence in the base of nothingness is very strong. And you realize quite deeply the immaterial realm. This is a realm where you don't have any emotional nonsense. Once there's full confidence, he either attains to the base of nothingness now. Now you can be walking around and actually doing things in a state of nothingness. When you go to neither perception or non-perception, you don't, you're not able to do that because your awareness is so subtle, you can't tell whether it's there or not. And this is why I tell people when they 
after, before they come out that they need to reflect on what happened before they came out so they can see the things through their memories. They can see the things uh, that arose and they can six are them. It only takes one or two minutes when you come out. That's after sitting for four hours or so, five hours, six hours, 12 hours, six days, whatever. Actually, you don't sit that long in that realm, but you can sit up to 24 hours pretty easily in that realm. On the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that this consciousness of his leading to rebirth may pass on to rebirth in the base of nothingness. That means you'll be reborn in a, a Brahma Loka or in one of the higher realms. I'm not sure that's correct. I'll have, to, I'll have to check. This monk is declared to be the first way directed to the base of nothingness. Again, a noble disciple gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or an empty hut considers thus, this is void of a self or of what belongs to a self. I, I've told you before, before I really had any Asian teachers outside of Usilananda and Manindra. Uh, when I was in Thailand by myself, because nobody else spoke any English at the places I was staying at, I had to do practices on my own. And the practice that I really liked doing was going into town, just kind of wandering around and seeing the impersonal nature of everything that's happening in my mind. And it was, it was fun doing it because I, I got, I started developing a real sense of humor about how, how nutty my mind was. I don't like this. I don't like that. All oh, this is weird. All of these kind of peculiar thoughts would come up. But when I noticed them, I asked myself, whose thought is that? Well, it might be a thought that I picked up from somebody in Australia or America on the other side of the world. Who knows? Who cares? It's real interesting to see how much credence we put in our own thoughts and demand that things be done in the way we want them to be done. We spend an awful lot of time and energy doing that. And it causes so much pain and suffering and we're doing it to ourselves. What bad habits we've had. How much pain have we caused our oceans of pain, according to some of the suttas. Well, that doesn't sound like a fun way to have a good existence, does it? It's painful when we start believing every little thing coming out of our mind. So it's a difficult practice. Sometimes you get caught and you wind up having all of this nonsense come into your mind and you start acting and you start doing things that get other people unhappy. 
And it's like you're doing it on purpose, but you're not really. You're just misunderstanding how mind works. And there's a huge amount of suffering that we cause to ourselves because of that. So it might be a suggestion for you with your daily activities, start doing that. Where did that feeling come from? Why is that thought there? Is it just because of an old habit, the way I think I should have been doing something? Or is it I'm picking it up from somebody else? Now, if you walk into a room where somebody's angry, you can feel that, right? Do you take that feeling to me, your feeling? I walked in happy and all of a sudden I, I can still be happy even though they, they're unhappy. Whose thought is it? Why do I take it as my thought? Why don't I just let it be and let it go? It doesn't mean anything at all. When he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. Once you have confidence in the base, it's a real power. And you don't get caught by things anymore. You don't get caught with prejudices. You don't get caught with judgments and criticisms. It's not that I need to know, it's just that I find it interesting and see how it's going. So having full confidence is mentally and physically consuming. It's really, really nice. He attains to the base of nothingness now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom on the dissolution after the it is possible leading to rebirth may pass on to rebirth in the base of nothingness. That just means changing from one realm to another. This is declared to be the second way directed to the base of nothingness. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, I am not anything belonging to anyone, anywhere. I'm not there. It's not me. I have a lot of people that tell me, I ask them a question, uh, especially if they're bored, or they have some kind of hindrance arising. Whose hindrance is it? Who doesn't like it? Who wants to control it? Who tries to make it be the way they want it to be? And it's always that false belief in a personal self. It's always me. And they'll say, well, it's I. No, it's me. I'm doing it to myself. I'm causing this upset. But the thing with that question, where'd that come from? Whose is it? Why did it come up? All of those kind of questions, they disappear. And you start seeing the impersonal nature of everything more and more clearly. So there's no nothing anywhere belonging to me. 
or anyone anywhere. It just comes up. Having this physical body is, is put there as a test to see how you react to it instead of respond to it. You respond to it by investigating more closely. Where'd that come from? Whose is that? Why am I taking this personally? It's an impersonal process. The people, when I ask them these kind of questions, they'll try to finagle their way around saying that they're doing it to themselves. Well, it's just this thought. Well, yeah, but whose thought is it? Who wants it to be different than it is? Who wants to control it? That's the big question, isn't it? We all want to control. When he practices it in this way frequently, abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. Once there's full confidence, he either attains to the base of nothingness now, or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. Resolves upon it with wisdom means that you can walk around. And, and this is kind of an interesting thing. I had a discussion with Usila Nanda. And I told him some of the experience that I was having with um, seeing the impersonal nature of everything. And I told him, you can do it while you're walking, while you're talking, while you're doing this or that. You can do it anytime. He said, oh, no, 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 absolutely not. You can only do that while you're sitting. And then he tried it. And he came back with kind of a sheepish look on his face and said, you were right. <laughs> on the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that this consciousness of his leading to the rebirth may pass on to, the, to rebirth in the base of nothingness. This monk is declared to be the third way directed to the base of nothingness. Now we get into the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Again, monks, a noble disciple considers thus, sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come. Sensual perceptions here and now and sensual perception in lives to come. Material forms here and now, and material forms in lives to come. Perception of forms here and now, and perception of forms in lives to come. Perceptions to the imperturbable, and perceptions to the base of nothingness. All are perception. Where these perceptions cease without remainder, that is the peaceful, that is the sublime, namely the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And that's the conversation I have with many of the students when you get to this realm. What relief it is not to have your mind going around making up stuff so it can be entertained and just sit quietly in the quiet mind for long periods of time. This is where your mind is most pure. You have no distractions. You have no craving arising. And that's real relief. 
When he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. <clears throat> Once he has full confidence, he either attains to the base of neither perception nor non-perception. That neither nor is kind of fun to contemplate. Well, what's in between? If I can't perceive it, is it there or not? Well, sometimes you can perceive another person's thought arising. Is it there or not? Physically, it's not, but it can still be there. Or else he resolves upon it with wisdom on the dissolution of the body after death. It is possible that this consciousness of his leading to rebirth may pass on to rebirth in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. That means that when you get into that realm, it lasts for 84,000 Mahakapas. Now that's a number that's kind of made up. Who knows? Might be longer, might be less. What difference does it make when you're talking about Mahakapas? expansions and contractions of the universe. I mean, <laughs> but it's, it's all of these uh, thousands of Mahakapas that's talked about in the suttas. It's, it's just a way of saying a really extended long period of time. Just like the Buddha, he couldn't even go to the bathroom without having 500 arahats follow him. Well, what is it talking about? Of course, they didn't do that. And it's just a way of saying there is a large number, and that large number might be 25, it might be 10. Who knows? Doesn't matter. It just gives you the idea that this is a large number of arahats that, that was following the Buddha at the time. This is declared to be the way directed to the base of neither perception nor non-perception. When this was said, the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, Venerable Sir, excuse me, here a monk is practicing thus. It might be, it might not be. It will be, it will not be mine. What exists, what has come to be, that I'm abandoning. Thus he obtains equanimity. Venerable Sir, do such, does such a monk attain Nibbana? An interesting question. One monk here, Ananda, might attain Nibbana and another might not attain Nibbana. What is the cause and reason, Venerable Sir, why one monk here might attain Nibbana, and another one here might not attain Nibbana. Here, Ananda, a monk is practicing thus. It might be, and it might not be mine. It will not be, and it will not be mine. What exists, what has come to be, that I am abandoning. Thus he obtains equanimity. He delights in that equanimity, welcomes it, and remains holding to it. That's a problem that some people have. When I'm giving them the directions, I tell them to go to equanimity and then radiate to all beings in all directions. And then they get into the quiet mind 
and they don't think they're supposed to be there, so they come back to the equanimity and they hold on to it. Now that's wrong practice. And I try to discourage that. So. Hold on to nothing. That is the way. As he does so, his consciousness becomes dependent on it and clings to it. And what is, what is clinging? That's the first part of your taking things personally. No, it's the second part of taking things personally. The first part is craving. A monk Ananda who is affected by clinging does not attain Nibbana. But venerable sir, when that monk clings, does he, uh, what does he cling to? To the base of neither perception nor non-perception, Ananda. When that monk clings, venerable sir, it seems he clings to the best object of clinging. And it is. When that monk clings, Ananda, he clings to the best object of clinging. For him, it is the best object of clinging. Namely, the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And I've seen that happen too. They really like being in that quiet mind. But what arises? Well, the, what arises is a real tiny little thought of, I wish Nibbana would hurry up and get here. Now, the way I found it's best not to have that happen is before you sit in meditation and tell yourself, I don't care what happens next. It doesn't matter what happens next. I sincerely don't care. My job is only to observe what happens and how it happens. Here, Ananda, a monk is practicing thus. It might not be, and it might not be mine. It will not be, and it will not be mine. What exists, what has come to be, that I am abandoning. Thus, he obtains equanimity. He does not delight in that equanimity and welcome and remain holding to it. Since he does not do so, his consciousness does not become dependent on it and does not crave or cling for it. A monk Ananda who is without craving and clinging attains Nibbana. No, I shouldn't say a monk, I should say a person. I don't care who it is. When you follow the directions precisely, exactly, you will be able to attain Nibbana. And what, what level of Nibbana? I don't know. So, happen. I can see how your practice is going. I can suspect that the practice might be is getting close, but I'm never going to tell you that because then you're going to jump at it and it's going to make it go away. It is wonderful, venerable, sir. It is marvelous. The Blessed One indeed has explained to us the crossing of the flood, independence upon one support or another. But venerable sir, what is noble liberation? Here Ananda, a noble disciple, considers thus. 
sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come. Sensual perceptions here and now and sensual perceptions in lives to come. Material form here and now and material form in lives to come. Perception of forms here and now and perception of forms in lives to come. Perceptions of the imperturbable, perceptions of the base of nothingness, and perceptions of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. This is person, uh, personality as far as personality extends. This is the deathless namely the liberation of mind through not craving and clinging. Thus, Ananda, I have taught you the way directed to the imperturbable. I have taught you the way directed to the base of nothingness. I have taught you the way directed to the base of neither perception nor non-perception. I have taught you the crossing of the flood independence upon one or another. I have taught noble liberation. What should be done for his disciple out of compassion by a teacher who seeks their welfare and has compassion for them? That I have done for you, Ananda. There are these roots of trees, these empty huts. Meditate, Ananda, do not delay, or else you will regret it later. This is our instruction to you. That's what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Kind of a fun sutta that keeps reminding you over and over about the impersonal nature of everything. There's nothing to hold on to. There's no reason to hold on to it. Change your old habits. And the more I talk about it, the more I really want you to practice where this thought come from. Why is that here? Where did it come from? Is it mine? I have this crazy thought come up? Or is it just some nonsense that mind wants to entertain itself with? If you do that sincerely, you will attain a higher level of meditation. And you will live in a world that is filled with joy and happiness, no matter what's happening on the outside. This nonsense with politics and all of that, it, it doesn't mean anything. Why try to make it mean something? Why get involved with any kind of anything but personal politics? And the personal politics is, where'd this thought come from? Why am I doing this to myself? That along with the six R's, you will be successful. So I've been talking for a while. Do you have any questions? Hi, Bhante. Hello. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Pat? I'm good, thank you. Good. Uh, um, I'm finding, uh, I generally sit an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening, and I'm pretty good at doing that. But I find as I get farther away from retreats that the entire hour, I am dealing with hindrances and I am working the six R's with them. 
Okay. So I think I know the answer, but um, your advice might be to sit longer, right? Because I'm breaking my sit right as I calm down. Right. You know, practice properly. Is that correct? Yes. I'll, I'll tell you a story about one student I had. She would sit for an hour. Now, she, she could get into neither perception or non-perception with ease. And she would sit for most of the time. And then at the end of an hour, she would go, well, there's nothing happening. I'm going to get up and go do something. And it drove me crazy. For three years, I scolded her over and over again. Stop doing that. And finally, she took a retreat with me, and I walked in with a big, heavy stick. And I slammed it down in front of her, and I said, I'm going to hit you hard with this if you don't longer. And it scared her enough that she did. And she sat for three hours with ease. And came back and started telling me the praises of sitting longer. I said, it only took you three years to hear what I was saying. And it was, I, I gave her short sentences. But it took her three years to be convinced that along with a big stick. So... Yeah. So the longer the other... you can sit, and it, it can be very useful <coughs> to have a weekend where there's not going to be any disturbances, that you just sit for the whole weekend for as long as you can. That can be very helpful, too. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then um, to make sure I'm not misunderstanding. So I, I, I take the, the three refuges every morning and the five precepts and make effort to keep them. But are these hindrances arising because I'm actually breaking the precepts or could it be from old karma that's coming up or um, both? It is from old karma. Okay. And sometimes you can try some tough love with your mind and say, enough of this. I don't want to be interrupted anymore. Stop. And it'll do it. So try that and see if it helps. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. Okay. Last week, I said that I found out that uh, Deepama, who was reputed to be an anagami, uh, isn't. She was reborn in a Deva Loka. And she was practicing with Mahasi Saida, who didn't understand what craving was. And she never taught that. She just taught the standard Mahasi line. Now, I'm not criticizing her in any way. I mean, she was brilliant with her, her able to sit like that. She sat for seven days for crying out loud. That's impressive. But there's an awful lot of people that will dispute that. So I don't think that you need to let me take the blame and, and you don't talk about it. Okay? I have big shoulders for that kind of blame, so it's not, not a big deal. Does anybody else have a question? Pante. Yes. Pante, on the question of when we ask ourselves, where did that thought come from? To me, the first answer I would give myself would be from craving and clinging. But you mentioned somewhere in your talk, and I can't remember the whole talk in one go, but you mentioned something about 
a thought coming from other people, or it seemed to me yeah. that you were saying that. So is the answer not always craving and clinging? Can there be other no, answers? The answer is always craving and clinging, but you don't tell yourself that. Right? Because that has craving and clinging in it. You just so the thought that it might come from somebody out. else is our craving. It doesn't matter. Okay. It's just thoughts. So don't don't take them personally. And don't, don't try to solve your problems by using your six R's as a stick to beat away these distracting kinds of things. Just question it and realize, no, it's not mine. It didn't come from me. That's where it comes from. Really. And it was just kind of entertaining for myself to think that it might be coming from so many in Australia. But I was entertaining myself, and I was just as caught up then as I was when I had that thought. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bunce, for your talk. Uh, yeah. Very much appreciate it. I have a quick question. So the sutta started out saying central pleasures are illusory, the prattle of fools. And this made me think of at the time of the Buddha, like kings and wealthy followers of the Buddha had access to all sorts of central pleasures, you know, food, sex, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But they followed his teachings and they had attainments that they had to let this go or like how, how do they balance it? How should we balance it? It, it depends on their, their practice, how far they went with it, where they were with it. But it's almost a guarantee. I, I'd have to say that it is a guarantee that if you do this practice that I'm talking about, where does it come from? Whose is it? If you do that sincerely for a period of time, all of those distractions will stop. They'll all go away. And you will attain some level of awakening. Because I'm a slow learner, it took me about six months. It won't take you that long. You can do it very quickly. Thank you, Bate. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Hello, Bonte. Hello. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. Um, I have a question. You were saying that um, when a distraction comes up, to question where does it come from? Okay. Um, so we do that. And also, we 6R or? Yeah. After we question where, right. where this distraction comes from. Right. After you realize that it's just a nothing burger. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And one last question. Okay. I find that a lot of times in the suttas, uh, the Buddha is talking to Ananda. And um, Ananda was an anagami, right? No. No? Oh, oh okay. He, he was a sotapanna. Oh, I see. Without, and, uh, without fruition. He just attained Sotapan. Oh, okay. Because the Buddha would advise him to continue meditating. Right. So in, there's always a, a, a course. Even though he's a Sotapanna, he, he needs to continue practicing or else he will regret it. Right. But the thing with Ananda was people would come around and try to talk to the Buddha all the time while he was taking rest, not necessarily sleeping, but taking rest. Mm -hmm. And he walked around the Buddha's kuti nine times every night. Mm -hmm. He got very little sleep. Uh. And he was making sure that everything was taken care of where the Buddha was, that the that monastery was running properly and everything was put back where it should be put back and clean when should be cleaned. So he was busy all the time. I see. And he would also go out with other, uh, other teachers 
to visit. And sometimes he would get invited for meals and that sort of thing. So he was a pretty busy guy. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh -huh. Anybody else have a question? Going once? Okay. Yeah. Hey, Bante. I had uh, one more question. Someone no, else is going first. Somebody, somebody else first. Go ahead. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm trying to sit longer than one hour. And um, after one and a half hours, I kind of get very tense and uh, nervous. And uh, it's it's getting uh, kind of a struggle. So no, that's to be recognized when it happens. But you still have to ask your question: Who is getting tense, and who doesn't like it, and who wants to be entertained and get up and move around? Yeah. Just relax into it. Just tell yourself, ah, there's, it's nothing to get upset about. Just relax and sit as long as you can, but you can't criticize yourself if you have a short sitting. Okay. Criticizing yourself is no fair. You have to be nice to yourself. And there might be some times because you've got other things to do, you might only be able to sit for a half an hour or even 15 minutes. Okay, do that. Be more flexible. Okay. Okay. And be kind to yourself. That's one of the main messages that I try to give people. Be nice to yourself. Don't criticize yourself. Don't think that you're supposed to be perfect. Because nobody's perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. And it's okay to do that as long as you're not attached to them. Okay. Okay, thank you. So smile and be happy. And you all have a happy new year. So, Romero? I think just one last question. Um, when, they, when the Buddha said that the base and other perception or non-perception is the best object for clinging. I thought no object right. is worth clinging to, but then they said, this is the best object to cling to. Does this mean if you were to make a mistake, right. that's not such a bad mistake to make, <laughs> to cling to, to, to base and other perception or non-perception? Right. That's where your mind is most pure. So that's a good place. To, if you're gonna cling to something, cling there. But of course, there's better if <laughs> you don't. <laughs> right. All right. Thank you. Okay. So you all have a happy new year, and I wish you the best year of your life. Thank you, Bante. I'll see you next Sunday. Bye bye. Merits. Yes, we're going to share Mary. Oh, sorry. Must be getting old. Forgot it. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all hear the merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So now, be happy. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, Bhante. Thank you. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Take care, David. Nice to see everyone.